Welcome to Russian History with Dr. Brovkin and Contemporary Issues with Dr. Brovkin. Today I'd like to discuss uh, Putin's uh, speech uh, and answers to questions at the Valdai uh, Club Conference. This is an annual conference that uh, gathers uh, specialists in Russian affairs, diplomats, journalists from many, many countries, and it's been going on for years. Uh, so this would be his message and my interpretation of that message, Putin's message to the world. Now, this was going on for three and a half hours. That in itself raises a question, how many world leaders do you have that can answer questions nonstop for three and a half hours? Can Macron do it? Probably. Can Scholz do it? He never did it. Uh, can Biden do it? I doubt it. But nevertheless, the questions were unexpected from various parts of the world. Uh, mostly people who were there were not hostile. Uh, it was definitely, since it's a club, it was an audience that more or less friendly, but from very, very different countries, from China, Pakistan, uh, from um, Africa, from various parts of the world, including uh, some from Britain, I recognize some faces. Uh, the context of this uh, Valdai Club meeting, even though it's the same time, it's about October every year, but this time it's against the background of uh, foreign ministers and the leaders of Europe meeting with Zelensky, uh, president of Ukraine in uh, Spain, against the background of speeches of how to finance Ukraine war effort and the forthcoming uh, 16th meeting in Rammstein with all the European countries in the United States, how to feed the uh, Ukrainian defense capability against the background of Zelensky's giving speeches that Ukraine is fighting for Europe, that if Russia is not stopped, Putin is going to come to Europe, is going to conquer Europe, and everybody has to be afraid of Russian aggression, Russian aggression, Russian aggression. So that's the background. So this is important because the me message of Putin is to several entities, and this is what I believe it is a message to Western, Western leaders, uh, in, in uh, American leaders separately from the European leaders, then the public opinion in Western Europe, then specifically the Hila message to small countries, especially those who border Russia. Uh, and then there was, a, I think the most important one, is, uh, well, obviously it's about the war and what's going to happen to it, but I think all of this is subordinate to him. Uh, and the most important thing is the one that nobody paid much attention to in the reactions to uh, his speech. <clears throat> and that is his concept of civilization and the new uh, order in uh, the world of civilizations, which I'd like to deal separately because it's a separate historical great issue that probably uh, deserves a separate discussion. But in terms of more immediate uh, responses as to day-to-day -day politics, uh, his message did uh, clarify a few things that were not clear to me uh, in the preceding months. And in that sense, it's very, very important that he said something that was not said before. Uh, some people picked on it and many people didn't. And this is why I'm doing this video to try to explain what exactly did he say that was new uh, and, and uh, of those who follow his speeches uh, and his uh, statements uh, and what it means. Okay, uh, so in terms of the uh, message to Western leaders, and I'll start with this topic. And, and, and in this package of messages to Western leaders, one of the most important one is about nuclear weapons. There was a question asked as to whether Russia should not lower the limit or the ceiling of uh, use of nuclear weapons because of the current threats. Uh, because there were some, and another speaker also asked a question, why is it now that some Russian um, commentators, such as Solovyov, say that the Russian retribution to the uh, supply of uh, Leopard tanks and uh, other missiles that Germany is considering sending should be that Russia should bomb Berlin. So uh, the question that was asked is, is it 
really something that Russia could do? Is it really something that Russia is considering using nuclear weapons or attacking the West European cities? Uh, to which Putin gave a very interesting answer. So Putin basically repeated that the, cha the doctrine hasn't changed and there are two uh, reasons when Russia could use nuclear weapons. And that's nothing new, uh, he, but w the way he answered it is new and this is where I'm coming to. So he said, the first one is Russia is attacked. If, there is, uh, if the um, interceptors receive a signal that nuclear missiles are flying towards Russia, and in that case, there would be a nuclear response. The second reason would be if the survival of Russian state will be a stake, which means not necessarily with a nuclear uh, attack. If some other uh, situation would arise that would threaten the survival of the Russian state, then Russia can respond to nuclear missiles, uh, with nuclear missiles. But uh, coming back to the first one, if Russia is attacked, and this is what's interesting, the way he presented it. He said, if there is a signal that nuclear missiles are flying towards Russia, then he said, and I quote, hundreds of missiles would automatically rise and go and hit where they are flying from. Now, anybody familiar with nuclear issues knows that uh, Britain doesn't have uh, a whole lot of nuclear missiles, certainly not any hundreds. Neither does France, nor India, nor Pakistan, nor China. The only country that has hundreds of missiles that could uh, fly towards Russia is the United States. And the only country that has hundreds of nuclear missiles who can fly is Russia. In other words, this is a message to the United States that Russia should be taken seriously and that um, it's the only country in the world that can destroy the United States. It's capable. And therefore, if you don't want to be destroyed, don't send any missiles in the direction of Russia. Now, that could also have an implication in terms of what he had said earlier and that he didn't repeat today, but I do want to bring it up. And that is that at one of his discussions earlier this year, uh, he said, if there is a missile flying towards Russia, how do we know if it has a nuclear warhead or not. Now, the implication of that reasoning is that if there is a long-range missile flying to Russia, let's say launched from Ukraine or from a bordering country, Russia cannot be sure that it's not a nuclear warhead. And therefore, the reasoning and the logic of it is that you better watch out because the response could be triggering World War III with hundreds of Russian missiles flying not to Ukraine, not to Poland, but to the original uh, commander-in-chief, which is to the United States. Now, this is new. This has never been said as clearly as he did it today. The message to the West is watch out. You're playing with fire. If you go too far with the, with the missiles, that you're long-range missiles you're trying to deliver to Ukraine, it can trigger World War III. Now, um, so this is about nuclear. Another thing that he said about nuclear, that it was not going to be uh, on Ukraine, no way, under any, and not to any European cities. So he basically made it very clear, it's, if the answer comes, it would be against the US, the, the only country that can launch a full-scale nuclear attack on Russia. So that's the message. Now, I come to the second topic, which is uh, the message on war. Uh, and where it is going. And again, here he did say a couple of things that are new, that in my uh, view, n not many people picked up in the West in the analysis uh, of his speech. So what is it that he said that was new? Somebody uh, rose and said that last year at the same conference, he asked Putin about the fate of Odessa uh, and that he, Putin declined to answer. And this year, he said, and this year I will answer. This is very interesting. He picked himself uh, to answer this question. And he said, Odessa is a Russian city with a little bit of Jewish in it, he joked. And then the question was repeated by uh, uh, Mrs. Simonian, who is the editor-in-chief of Russia Today, a network of uh, TV stations all over the world that are actually um, blocked and uh, not allowed on air in the freedom of speech 
as we supposedly have. Russia today is blocked. In any case, uh, Simonian asked him ag again about Odessa. Where do we stop, did she, she ask? Is Odessa going to be Russian? Uh, and, and he answered. He repeated, Russia, I mean, Odessa is a Russian city. So this is very interesting that he revealed it for the first time, that Russian war plans do include Odessa. But then he qualified it. And he said, we are not after territory. Russia has more territory than any other country in the world. We are defending our people. So this formulation is very interesting. To me, the message is that borders are flexible. Borders are up to negotiations. The only thing that, that Putin insisted on is that the people, the Russian people, and that means the Russian-speaking area, that means Donbass, this means Novorossiya, this means uh, Odessa, and presumably Kharkov, a Russian-speaking city. That, that means that that's the war plan. I don't know that, that, that implication of it. That's my interpretation. I may be wrong. But at least in terms of borders, that's what he said. He also was asked what about Ukraine, whether it can, whether Russia has objections to it joining European Union. And he said, no, no, go ahead. If they want to join it, if European Union wants to take it, go ahead and do it. Now, the implication of that, of course, message is that Russia has no plans to take over all of Ukraine. At least this is the way I read this message. He, of course, qualified by saying it's ruined, it has um, no assets, it's going to be a burden for, you, for European Union, and if they want it, fine, let them take it. Uh, so, in any case, the, 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 the issue is that borders are up to negotiations. Then he had all this huge discussion on borders. He said, basically, why are European borders sacrosanct? They were not. They have never been. And he gave examples that Kosovo split from Yugoslavia, all of Yugoslavia split up, uh, and, and then uh, Montenegro split, split up from Serbia, and then Kosovo split up from Serbia, and all these splits were just fine with Western Europe. I can add that Czechoslovakia split into Czechia and Slovakia. It's okay. Uh, and then um, uh, Montenegro split from Serbia and joined NATO, without any referendum, without any um, uh, formal procedure, that's all okay. But when Donbass split from Ukraine, no, that's unacceptable. These borders are sacrosanct forever and ever. That, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the reasoning behind his objection to this kind of reasoning that uh, Russian borders will be borders. But I think he put a great emphasis on uh, the other issue, which is denazification and demilitarization. He again repeated that NATO expansion is unacceptable, and he again said that the ultimate plan and the ultimate goal is to create new collective security in Europe. And that means, he, he speaking to a Moldovan representative, he said that a Moldova shouldn't worry about it, that Russia is not going to dictate its rule to small countries and neighboring countries, that they're safe, but they should be safe, not under the protection of NATO, but under mutual uh, guarantees of security to uh, all countries in Europe. So this is his long-term uh, tenet that he repeated over and over again. Again, what is new in the message is that the borders will be changed. But after that, and, and the denazification, which means this regime is unacceptable. The regime that has been applauding in Canada, he made a long, big story about it, the applauding of Canadian Parliament, including Zelensky, including Prime Minister Trudeau, to a Nazi officer of SS. Uh, he's, uh, Putin basically reasoned like, if they applaud him, that means they agree and they know he's a Nazi. That means they applaud the neo-Nazi regime in Ukraine because that regime is, uh, considers itself a follow-up to uh, the uh, Galicina SS division to Stepan Bandera, who uh, collaborated with the Nazis, and they're guilty of uh, uh, a million and a half Jews killed in Ukraine alone. In other words, he made a, a big deal about connecting the current regime to uh, the Zelensky regimes to the Nazi past, 
uh, of Stepan Bandera. And that is why denazification is necessary. And this is, would be something of the conditions of peace. Uh, and the peace will not with the current regime of Zelensky, but with another regime that would be established after victory. I think that's uh, his main message. So to sum up, there, I want to go to different issues, uh, but this is a subject for a separate video. But the most important one in this one, it's a message to the West that Russia is ready for peace negotiations on its terms which means denazification, demilitarization, no expansion of NATO, and revised borders in Ukraine. In my next videos, we'll discuss whether it's feasible or not, and also what his other message was to the global south and on civilizational issues. Thank you.